On behalf of CSIS and the U.S. Naval Institute, uh, we're proud to bring you the next event in our Maritime Security Dialogue Series. This series is made possible by uh, the generous uh, sponsorship and support of HII. 2022 marks the 100th anniversary of the aircraft carrier. Uh, according to a recent Maritime Security Dialogue guest, uh, Admiral Mike Gilday, Chief of Naval Operations, quote, our aircraft carriers remain the most survivable and versatile airfields in the world and provide our national leaders valuable options across the entire competition continuum, end quote. Along those lines, we're excited to share this centennial celebration with all of you, both in person and virtually, and we're delighted uh, to be able to host it at the U.S. Naval Institute's Jack C. Taylor Conference Center in Annapolis, which is a beautiful conference center. Uh, thank you to Vice Admiral uh, Kenny Whitesell, Rear Admiral Jim Downey, and Rear Admiral Andy uh, Lozell for joining us and over to Commander Ward Carroll, Director of Outreach at the U.S. Naval Institute, to introduce our guests and kick off this fantastic dis uh, discussion. Ward, over to you. Thank you, Seth. Welcome, everyone, to the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. When Admiral Warden founded the Naval Institute in 1873, one of his tenets was the power to convene. And so through the leadership of Admiral Daly, over the most recent years, we now have a home field, so we're very happy to host the Maritime Security Dialogue here at the Jackson Taylor Conference Center. We're also happy to have three major prongs of the naval aviation enterprise here in person. And at the 100th anniversary of carrier aviation, it is great to have the folks in this billet. So let me go through their bios, which are very impressive, very quickly here. So first, we'll start with the Air Boss, Vice Admiral Kenny Weitzel, who I have known for some years. Graduate of ODU, went the AOCS route, got his NFO wings, and then was assigned as a radar intercept officer in the F-14. He did his nugget tour in VF-142, the Ghost Riders. Then he was a RAG instructor at VF-101, the Grim Reapers, where he and I served together. He was the tactics phase leader. I can tell you he ran a tight ship, got X's in the block. He did his Super J-O tour in VF-74, the B-Devilers. He was a department head in VF-32, the Swordsman. Then he transitioned to the Super Hornet, he had command of VFA-41, the Black Aces, the commander of Air Wing 1. Then he was commander of Strike Group 2 aboard the George H.W. Bush, CVN-77. He's had shore duty in the Pentagon and also as PERS-4, which gives him a broad portfolio for tackling the challenges he has now. He was deputy commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet. Was that when Lung was Pacific Fleet? Another Tomcat Bubba. And he's been the air boss since October of 20, over 4,000 flight hours and over 1,000, actually 1,005 arrested landings. So, Admiral Weitzel, thank you for joining us today. Next to him is Rear Admiral James Downey, graduate of sunny Albany. First sea tour was aboard the USS Haler, which was a Spruance class, Jim, yeah. Master's degree in computer science from the Naval Postgraduate School, and then he pivoted and became a engineering duty officer. His portfolio of NAVC prog programs are basically a who's who of all the important programs. Include GPS integration, Tomcat integration, I'm sorry, Tomahawk integration. He was OIC of the Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command. Chief Engineer of the CVN-21, which set him up uh, well for his current role. Program Manager of DDG-1000, where he oversaw the delivery of the Zumwalt to the fleet. NAVC, Deputy Commander for Surface Warfare, and he's been PEO carriers since June of 2019. And then our last panelist is Rear Admiral Andrew Loisel, graduate of Assumption College, and he did in that capacity ROTC at Holy Cross, which means we have two Holy Cross routes, you guys in the room. I think that defines a mutiny. So one of you is gonna have to take your shoes off. I'm not sure who wants to do that, you or Admiral Daly. Um, received his pilot wings of gold in January of 91. Nugget in VF-142, flying the F-14B model of the Tomcat. So we have two Ghost Riders on the stage. And as a former puking dog, I gotta say, I'm not terribly happy with that. So that's an inside Tomcat joke. That was our sister squadron, yeah. Um, served at VX-9 in the test and eval world. Transitioned to the legacy Hornet, the F-18C, 
was a department head in VFA 125, then had command of VFA 146. Graduated from nuclear power school after being selected for the carrier CO pipeline with honors. Deep draft was the Gunston Hall, LSD 44, and he had command of the George H.W. Bush, CVN 77. He was commander of strike group eight aboard Truman, and then he was also the commander of strike group four, which is the training strike group. He's been the director of the Air Warfare Division N98 since June of 2021. So gentlemen, thank you for being here. Let's get right to it. So Air Boss, this year, 100 years of carrier aviation. The Chinese just launched their latest aircraft carrier. Hypersonics are in the mix. So a lot of folks are saying the day of the aircraft carrier is over. How do you answer that charge? Yeah, I think when I look back over, as we look backwards over the centennial of naval aircraft carriers, we also have to look at, you know, where we're going forwards and uh, in answering that question. So uh, I look at the, the various classes of carriers that we had, and then I, then I would pause on the, the newly decommissioned a few years ago, USS Enterprise, uh, that had 40 classes, 40 different types of aircraft uh, over its 50 plus uh, year history. I look at the evolution of the Nimitz class and now the Ford uh, class and that same evolution of the air wing is what adds to the lethality and is the centerpiece for our maritime strategy as we go to the two uh, tenets that CNO talks about in his, uh, in his, uh, in his orders are maritime uh, sea control and power projection. That air wing of the future is already manifested, partially manifested uh, over the last uh, year in the past two cruises uh, with Vincent and Abraham Lincoln. Joint strike fighter uh, with uh, VFA uh, 147 uh, had a successful deployment on Vincent. You combine that with CMV 22 E2 uh, D growler capabilities, the workhorse of the uh, uh, of the Super Hornet. Uh, on the ship uh, also as well as the, the Romeo Sierra capabilities and look at where they employed uh, Vincent itself uh, right in the heart of the first island chain uh, and some of the capabilities that we see briefed in other channels on, on how that carrier was received. To make sure that it wasn't uh, uh, obviously not a fluke, uh, now we bring Abraham Lincoln, who is in Hawaii right now doing RIMPAC, and to make sure that TAC air integration is alive and well. Now we've got VMFA uh, 314, the Marine Corps, with their F-35 Charlie variants, too, in the same, same model as they use maneuver space throughout the Western Pacific uh, to present dilemmas uh, to our threat. Uh, and the feedback that we're getting there is, uh, has been pretty, uh, has been uh, absolutely phenomenal. The way not only the legacy platforms uh, performed, but the new platforms uh, uh, that we had. We've got increases in range capability. Uh, we're progressing in our increases of weapons capability. The maneuverability of the carrier, it's been written about multiple times. Uh, while we talk about weapons engagement zones, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a worn out uh, argument to me it is, when you take weapons engagement zones and you plop the, uh, the little mushrooms down on a chart and you treat them as if uh, they're no penetration zones. You gotta remember that targeting for the threat to target us is just as difficult as we have for targeting for them. So they have to be able to satisfy uh, the kill chain at the same time that we have to be able to satisfy the kill chain. And I'm pretty satisfied with uh, uh, some of the capabilities that we've got and we're, we're, uh, uh, we're satisfying that, uh, that kill chain. Uh, again, Vincent, Abraham Lincoln with our partial uh, air wing in the future as we move towards and the roadmap for my number one vision statement for uh, building a capability and capacity to win in great power competition, uh, those two inst uh, uh, instantiations uh, for Vincent and Abraham Lincoln, and we're not resting on our laurels there. Uh, upgrades to F-35 Charlies, we go to Tech Refresh 3, uh, Block 4. Uh, as we get service life modification in Super Hornets to get them to 10,000 hours, brand new buy uh, of Super Hornets Block 3s, as well as uh, service life modification into Block 3s, we get it up to 10,000 hours. Growler, uh, as we go to Growler capabilities model, Block 2, Growler E2D with uh, its Hawkeye uh, um, 
DS, uh, E2D uh, system software uh, capabilities, what's going to be the follow-on platform, the increased logistic rings uh, for CMV22. I think we're responding to the threat and we're responding to this great power competition environment uh, to set ourselves up uh, to compete exactly where the carrier was meant to go, and that's forward. Uh, I'm not going to forget about my East Coast brethren. You look at what HST Harry S. Truman is doing uh, in the Mediterranean now as under the command of NATO uh, and flying, uh, flying, flying some pretty exciting missions uh, uh, in support of NATO for the aggression, the Russian aggression uh, across Ukraine. And then you know, not going to leave anything else, uh, the others out. The P-8s have have absolutely knocked it out of the park with their ASW capability. The growlers, both expeditionary as, deploy, as well as deployed, our growlers are uh, a critical uh, uh, unit is on the ground in Poland right now doing, uh, doing incredible uh, uh, AEA work, again, supporting the, uh, the NATO effort there. Um, it's, uh, I, I think we're in a good position right now, not resting on our laurels. Gerald R. Ford, uh, I know uh, Jim Downey's going to talk about that, but Gerald R. Ford, as she comes out and uh, heads out to sea here this fall uh, with her uh, with uh, the partial air wing that she's going to have, uh, I think we're in a good position right now. Both platforms, carrier platforms, aircraft platforms, and weapon systems that uh, that Bucket's got in the, in the hopper for us to buy. So talking about the F-35's first deployment on Vinson, uh, I know there were some challenges with what we traditionally think of as FMC, but what you were saying to me before is, you know, to frame it that way doesn't account for just how different the F-35 is. So talk to us about, for instance, you know, it, the four plane is the way that you execute that, and that's your like Adam is four airplanes, yeah. and the fact if Dash One doesn't have a radar, he still has total SA because of what the other airplanes have. Yeah. Things that as yeah. Gen Four guys we just can't even think about. Yeah, that's a great con the refreshing me back to that. You know, you take a thirty thousand foot view of the way the air wing is going to be employed, and it's completely different than even me as a legacy guy and you, and you looking back to it's not the air wings not going to be employed the uh, the same way f-35 is a perfect exemplar of uh, of that the way we employ that platform it isn't you know we don't there's no welded wing defensive offensive combat spread and then you break out into uh, into some of the the traditional missions that we would have done uh, five or uh, ten years ago employing jo the joint strike fighter as uh, as we uh, as they employed it as a uh, as a division uh, I'm not going to go into the, the specific tactics techniques and procedures but the way they employed it you know definitely more spread out the way information is shared amongst the platform uh, makes up for any deficits uh, that a, an individual uh, aircraft may have. So way, the way we think of mission capability and full mission capability, we have to think about it in a distributed and in a, in this case, in a full division or greater employment mode through distributed maritime ops. And again, fitting into the bigger vision of distributed maritime ops, uh, a single platform can have degradations but because of the information sharing that's shared between the, uh, the platform, uh, we have to think about how we're gonna define full mission capability, not platform specific, but truly mission specific. A different way of looking at things. So as we mentioned at the outset, this is the enterprise, man trained and equipped, and the requirements at the end there with Admiral Loisel. So Bucket, there's been great hue and cry around the 2023 budget submission in a whole bunch of ways. Uh, we've talked about the shipbuilding plan. Uh, the Commandant Marine Corps has been beat up pretty good for Force Design 2030. So how are you postured in terms of the budget and your requirements therein? So, uh, I think that's on. All right, so um, I would say for Palm 23 in the aviation portfolio, uh, I think the thing that drew most people's attention was the reduction in the number of F-35s uh, across the fiscal year's defense plan. And so uh, while clearly that uh, is not something that naval aviation wanted, uh, there are some significant bills that need to be paid uh, within the Navy writ large. So uh, the CNO has been very clear on what his guidance was to us in the formation of the POM, and Columbia uh, was the number one priority. And so, uh, and then we were asked to go for capability, 
Columbia, readiness, capability, and then capacity. So the number of aircraft that I have in a given configuration fell into that last category. What does not fall into that category are the upgrades to those aircraft, i.e. Uh, the TR-3 Block 4 that Airboss mentioned, or down the line into the rest of our aircraft for uh, going after things like an infrared search and track for the, uh, for the Super Hornet fleet, going to Block 3 configuration for the Super Hornet fleet. And so, uh, and accompanying that is a family of weapons for each of those aircraft to, uh, to bring out to the fight that are of significantly longer range than, uh, than anything that we've had in the past. So um, bottom line is, do I have everything that I want? No, absolutely not. But neither does anybody else in this budget. So, uh, so uh, there's, there's uh, something for everybody to dislike in, in fiscal 23. And so uh, the CNO was very generous on his unfunded priority list and put some of the things that you didn't see in the budget onto that list. And as you can see from some of the traffic that's come out of Congress at this point in time, there is interest in adding to the DOD top line uh, by the time we get the appropriations for fiscal 23. And uh, it's our sincere hope that a lot of Naval Aviation's priorities will be uh, categorized within that final budget. So if you had to give a color code to your ability to meet the requirements, what color is it? I, I would go with yellow. So, so bottom line is we're getting 44 strike fighters out on each of our aircraft carriers. Uh, anybody that's ready to deploy has all of their aircraft uh, ready to go uh, in time for the entire OFRP cycle. There's none of this last minute uh, engagement. And as I'm sure Airbus will talk to in one of the questions later, uh, we've made tremendous strides across all of our type model series in uh, being able to get massive amounts of readiness out of the dollars that we're given. So we're getting much more intelligent about how to utilize the dollars that we're given to generate the highest level of readiness. And so, uh, so as far as current configuration of our uh, flight decks and the plan that we've built to get to the air wing of the future, I'm comfortable in that regard. So Admiral Downey, we're talking about aircraft carriers. You have two principal concerns. One is getting forward to sea, and then the RCOH picture. So how are we looking currently with the recoring of two boats that are in RCOH right now? Uh, we are, across the portfolio, very busy. Right at Newport News alone, we have uh, 73 and 74, of course, 73 wrapping up that I'll come back to in a, in a minute, and 74 is uh, just starting its our second year. But we are also, um, we're getting, uh, we're progressing JFK, who delivers in two years, in uh, 24. At the end of August, uh, the 27th of August, we do the keel laying on Enterprise. So significant work there going on on the new Enterprise. And of course we are, um, well into the Doris Miller from the, the two ships uh, procured in uh, 2019. I'll come to, I'll hit forward for a second and then back to GW. Uh, that portions of that team are also, um, uh, have been a, a support in Ford throughout this last couple of years with lots of work that I'm sure we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, but that team has tried to take a lot of those lessons learned and get it back over into the shipyard onto 79 and follow. Uh, 73, uh, GW herself, she's at 95% complete, uh, the ship overall. Uh, we are wrapping up the propulsion plant work uh, and the topside work. So she delivers uh, right around the, uh, the beginning of the calendar year. Um, at this point in the program, uh, so we're well past the refueling, um, we're well past that work. At this point in the program, we get into a very lockstep approach on uh, going to a certain state in the propulsion plants and getting the crew uh, through their qualifications to operate the uh, nuclear plants uh, as they've been refueled. And then we go on to combat systems uh, uh, testing this fall uh, and on to those evolutions and get back to uh, the redelivery uh, phase here in the uh, December to January time frame. So uh, this ship I'll just share with the group. Uh, you can go back in time. Uh, we were going to refueler. We were going to inactivator. And we shifted back uh, to, um, to refueler. 
so that slid her schedule to begin with uh, several years to the right and had a cascading impact on uh, onto uh, Stennis as well. Uh, not only in schedule, um, but also in the workforce, in the industrial base. So for all good reasons at the time, we took what was a toe-to-heel refueling a complex overhaul program, uh, and we changed that schedule. It did uh, that ahead of COVID, had a pretty significant impact on, uh, on the shipyard. And we have, I know, uh, HII, uh, uh, sponsoring to some degree here, but uh, had a dramatic impact on the level of experience in the shipyard and put a gap in the knowledge experience from 72 to 73. So we are uh, principally through that now. Um, we are on to the a very fixed uh, five-month period of where the work is determined, mainly activating the propulsion plant uh, and, and the qualifications and the... Um, and the readiness for C. So we're confident uh, she's in their final phase. She'll come out around the beginning of the year. Uh, we have changed some of our processes uh, from 73 to 74 contractually. Uh, waterfront integration teams, uh, fleet introduction teams, and I think uh, the ship side of it as well as looking in the future about how we uh, man and uh, and prepare some of these ships and uh, going into such deep maintenance. So we've learned a lot from 73. We need to get her wrapped up and uh, get her back on her uh, redelivery phase, which is, which is where we're headed right now. So Bucket and I did the shakedown of 73 back in 1992, so that's uh, making me feel a little bit old. So let's talk about Ford. Uh, I know we don't want to talk any specifics about future schedules, but when do we expect that that will be a, let's just call it a fleet asset, and what capabilities does that bring that are game changers that maybe the audience isn't aware of? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so first, a very intense last three years. Uh, but that's a microcosm of, of, uh, of coming up with a new class. So just quickly, uh, the latter half of the 90s was the analysis of alternatives for this new class of ships. So uh, think 96, 97 plus, And then look at that as a delivery in 2017 in all the work since. So quite a long time, 20 plus years to get to delivery of the first of a class with a Nimitz hotline, you know, right up through Bush. The point of that is um, these, are, uh, these are capital assets that you've gotta, you've gotta stay steady on and you've gotta stay after. Uh, and you, you've gotta keep that uh, material and industry uh, flow going to achieve those goals. So I just, I share, uh, took a lot of folks uh, well before the current generation uh, to get her to 2017. She went into her, uh, her initial workups post shakedown and I came aboard three years ago as we were in the last phase of post shakedown. As we talked about where she's going, uh, over the last three years, um, she's a year, one to two years ahead of where we forecasted. So over the last uh, three years, we wrapped up PSA an 18-month uh, post-delivery test and trials. Very unique situation where the air wing embarked as well. Uh, the strike group embarked. Surface combatants deployed uh, with her. She spent out of that 18 months, 250 days at sea. Out for a month, in for a month. That was to ring out the C2 on board instead of just meet the basic mission requirements of the ship and avoid that period after. Pretty intense effort there. And she finished that and ran up to seven to 8,000 cats and traps over that period. Uh, when we were out about two weeks ago, she passed her 10,000th uh, cat and trap. So from there, we went on to shock trials, an effort that's been discussed for years. Uh, and we had a four-month uh, shock trial period, really based upon 20 years of component design. And uh, I think the team should be pretty proud of that effort. She ended up with 20% of the damage or work from shock trials that 71 had in the late 80s. 20%. Uh, that's industrial or man hours to fix things. Of that 20%, 85% of it was repairable by ship's force speaks to the design. So a very, very solid uh, design. 
came out of that and the ship finished, uh, this is the first East Coast CNO availability we've done in a private shipyard in a very long time. And she came out a day early uh, back in March. So that team from the uh, ship CO on down, from the other leadership on the waterfront has really been clicking uh, very well. She's in a compressed workup cycle right now. In addition to that, there are operational tests that are going on. She just came through a special, uh, special trials uh, there, and she's, uh, she's on track to go this fall, as the Navy's been talking about. That's a, that's a multi-nation event that'll run over the fall. We've got about seven other nations uh, with, uh, with other assets out there with her, uh, including the French and, uh, and UK carriers, and we've got about three other nations on as staffs. So there's 10 other nations uh, planned to be out there with her. Um, on the specifics, that's a very dynamic world uh, that we see today, so I will, uh, that's, that's kind of where we are with her. Um, but uh, the ship is doing an excellent job, and the type commander has got a really great team there uh, getting her ready for deployment. So let's remind the viewers that th this was ambitious, 23 new major systems on a platform. Uh, CNO has been on record as saying maybe that was too many. We have beat ourselves up about that. But let's also either educate or remind the audience that the Ford class was not going to be greenlit if it was just a an evolutionary design. It needed to be revolutionary. So this is one of the paradoxes of procurement. So again, at the end of all of this, we're going to get a pretty amazing capability. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this was a two to three ship evolution to get to where she is today, right? So CVNX one and two, and there were decisions in the early 2000s, not unique to nuclear aircraft carriers. Uh, to um, we need to advance these technologies and these warfighting capabilities. So a lot of risk there. Um, analyzing and understanding the concurrent risk of all those efforts um, is probably uh, where we were a bit off on, uh, on how we could do that. I think there's other programs that uh, track to historical progress of change the hull, stick with the hull, change the... Uh, weapon system, uh, then, you know, and the propulsion plant, not all at once. Um, but uh, there's different, uh, different requirements and different rationale based upon uh, the time of the day of 22 years ago versus today. But she's, um, the, the key systems that you all talk about and have had lots of coverage, uh, overall dual band radar, uh, was very successful during those post delivery tests and trials period, emails and AEG. Like I said, uh, through the first two years was about 747 traps, 17 to 19, and now we're at about 10,000. Um, the key areas to, so I think we're through the majority of understanding how to operate the systems, commissioning them. We've learned a lot on operator procedures. The key phase to look for now is how we sustain those, those efforts. It takes some time to get feedback in the system on how a system's performed, how we're stimulating industry and the supply system. Uh, so our focus uh, for her is certainly shifted over to uh, the sustainment phase and how we keep her ready. As we handicap the threat, as I mentioned, uh, the Chinese just launched Fujian, which has emails, but that's a conventional powered carrier. So they're gonna have to refuel like every other day to power the emails, whereas the new power plants on the Ford class have excess energy capacity, which powering emails is no big deal. In fact, that excess capacity can be used in the future for a self-defense capability uh, that can make hypersonics maybe a moot point as well. So um, Airbus, let's, let's double click on something that Admiral Loisel was talking about in terms of your ability to eke out a lot of readiness from the existing budget. So let's remind everybody, when you and I were uh, in VF-101 as instructors, um, you know, we celebrated how awesome the Tomcat was, but there were some lean days in terms of flat hour funding and readiness, right? Where you'd come back from deployment and you'd give all your jets to the, uh, the, air, the squadron that's about to go. I remember when we were at the RAG, we had 50 airplanes, only two were up, and they were using, <laughs> being used in the tactics phase. Um, so how are we looking now in terms of 
you know, taking care of aviators during the tournament and also giving maintainers what they need to do their job without working weekends and late hours? Yeah, that's a great question. When we, two years ago, two and a half years ago, when we started the Naval Sustainment Strategy, aviation performed a plan, which was the, the, the precursor to get real, get better. Uh, uh, starting that process to understand, you know, where we were in the sustainment piece, the supply piece, the flight hour, the the consumable parts, the the depot level repairables, the C2 structure uh, was critical. Essentially, seven pillars for us that came together under a C2 with the air boss as the supported commander, the one responsible to the CNO, and that was the catalyst uh, for us to drive mission capability. Uh, uh, and set numbers. The most significant thing that occurred for us uh, early last year uh, was with the vice chief to understand and be able to set with a mathematical problem what the, the North Stars were for every aircraft and then translate that NSSA performed a plan process uh, into every platform as we in, as we institute those platforms in uh, the Maritime Operations Center, and then each one of those pillars uh, functions the way it did on Super Hornet Growler to get us initially to 341 Super Hornets. Uh, the new number is 360, and two weeks ago we hit 372 mission-capable uh, Super Hornets. And that's now moving through a transition, a transformation and sustainment team across every one of the platforms. What it's doing is it's efficiently using the, that flight hour program, which has five pedals that I have to push, the flight hour money, the, uh, the depot level repairables, uh, the consumable piece contracts, and then contract air support. And I have to play those, uh, 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 play each one of those pedals. When it comes down to the maintainability side, industry has stepped up magnificently over the last two years with the reliability control boards. We're getting what we're paying for, and the time on wing is more than it was. You and I would walk out to CSDCs, IMUs, man up a couple different Tomcats before we would ever get airborne. That's not the case uh, anymore. You go out to an airplane, you man it up, uh, we're going to fly it. Uh, uh, and industry has risen to the occasion with the, tran uh, the transparency piece of what's the reliability and the time on wing side of the house. And that's translated into a time where we were giving significant amount of flight hours per year. We couldn't burn the flight hours. People would come back to us appropriately and say, you don't know your business. You keep asking for more inputs. Give me more flight hours, I'll be better. Give me more flight hours. And at the time, we could never get above a certain number. At the time, 250 mission-capable super hornets. Now we know our business. We know what the major drivers are to drive mission-capable platforms, and we can effectively use the flight hours that we have right now. Again, not resting on our laurels. Now that we've set benchmarks, North Stars, for mission capability, we're now going to full mission capable uh, aircraft with an, uh, an, an FMC uh, metric uh, that was just briefed to me this week that I'll talk to the Vice Chief uh, this week to just to get us get a uh, gauge check from him, it, from him if the methodology is correct. That again, that'll drive us to a lethality and a survivability piece for every single airplane. So not only advancing as buckets buying uh, capabilities, advancing in capabilities, but now once we have them, then we're able to maintain them and sustain them in a sustainable and a lethal way. So let's, uh, got some questions here online and also we'll take questions from the audience what we ask is that you come to this area right here. We don't have any mics, so ask the question of whomever panelist you're addressing it to, and I will have to repeat it to make sure that our viewers uh, hear it. So uh, if you want to queue up while I'm asking this question, that would be great. So this is from retired Marine Colonel Paul Crosacher, who is an H-53 driver who I actually worked with at the V-22 program. And so, of course, his question is, can you tell us how the CMV-22 did on its first deployment? Do you see the role of the CMV-22 evolving from the moving equipment and supplies to other missions? It would also be well suited for, like medevac, airborne comm relay, humanitarian assistance, or disaster relief. Yeah, that's exactly at the Marine Corps. And, and uh, the, you know, because he's a Marine Corps officer, the Marine Corps, I would be remiss you know, taught our instruct, taught our maintainers how to work on that platform, and taught our instructors and our and our pilots how to fly that. So we have a big debt of gratitude to the Marine Corps. The the key with the uh, MV22 or CMV22 
uh, increased uh, gas payload that was that is the significant difference from MV22 is the ability, as he talked about, to do some of the medevac work. We've always been able to do the logistics work to include the range uh, for that platform, the ability to bring a CMV22 aboard the carrier at night. You know, C2s, we've been reticent in the past based on the avionics that are in the platform to not do night carrier landings uh, on, board the, on board the ship. So now with CMV-22, uh, based on we're still taking three on deployment with us, still the detachment mentality, but the ability to get parts out as soon as they come to shore uh, and uh, get them out to the flight deck day or night time frame for that. Obviously, it was built, uh, one of the specs was to be able to take the power sections for JSF, the comms relay piece uh, is, uh, I'm watching with the Marine Corps uh, as they are already doing with some of their, uh, their MV-22 for comms capability and then add future capability uh, uh, as, the need, as the need demands. But with distributed maritime ops, longer ranges, distances between multi-carrier operations, distances from land-based uh, areas and the ability for CMV-22 to plop down on unimproved spaces, uh, it is a game changer, and it proved to be a game changer uh, for us uh, on deployment. The medevacs were, uh, were pretty big. It's not a catapult shot uh, that now the senior flight surgeon's got to worry about. Uh, now we can, fly somebody off, uh, we can fly somebody off immediately for that. You look at it and you say, well, you took three on deployment. For CODs, you always have one in phase maintenance. So you have about a 66, even with the C2, you always had about 66% mission capability. And sure enough, with CMV-22, our maintenance schedule for the inaugural deployment was exactly the same. We still had about 67% mission capability rate as we had one, uh, one of the platforms in phased maintenance. But now we've moved, we're looking at the class maintenance plan for every platform that we have. CMV-22 is safe and efficient on its first deployment, and we'll start looking at all of those plans uh, as we, uh, just like we're doing for every other platform. So if I'm the handler, am I happy to have an Osprey instead of a C2? Uh, I think you are. Uh, the worry was a palm tree, a, a stuck, uh, uh, that has proven uh, uh, the reliability uh, from Bell Boeing, that's proven. We didn't have an issue with that on Vincent. We never didn't have an issue with that uh, on uh, Abraham Lincoln, and there's contingencies to be able to move where we're going to put a palm tree uh, CMV-2, CMV-22. The ability to get it on and off the deck in a, in a rather rapid fashion. I don't have to clean uh, catapults three and four up and land a cod. Now I can uh, land it just like a helicopter. Uh, I can reposition it as soon as it offloads uh, or prior to onload. I can take it back into starboard delta. I don't have to set the flight deck up, especially cats three and four, to be able to launch a cod off gone. Hey, we're late, but we're late in cycle. You know all the scenarios. We're late in the cycle. We've got it, but we got to wait for the cod uh, to detach. The flexibility for CMV22 was good for the handler. It was scary for you know Vincent's first handler uh, was worried about it, and the fact that you know he had to transport it across to free up his deck multiple. You know that that was some consternation because we did have the. Um, uh, the recompression chambers on uh, for that first deployment, uh, or we for that last deployment of the recompression chambers. Once we took those off, it built uh, some hangar bay space uh, for the handler. So I think I have not heard any complaints from the flight deck crew or a handler of the two carriers that have deployed CMV-22. Good question. Yeah, if you've never seen how an Osprey folds, you should treat yourself to uh to what, looking at that on, on YouTube. Okay, ground rules, hello. Ground rules for questions, no speeches, ask a question. I'm gonna have to repeat what you ask, so please identify who you are and then ask your question. Hi, thank you all for being here. I'm Audrey Decker with Inside Defense, and I have a question on, this is for any member of the panel, on uh, the strike fighter shortfall. In recent hearings, Congress has voiced some concern over latest projections that it won't be, the gap won't be filled till 20, 31. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the Navy is doing in the next eight to nine years to stay operationally ready. So the question is about the strike fighter number of airplanes on flight decks. This is really your master aviation plan, Airbus. Uh, you have done infographics about this. So uh, what's or is this a okay? okay. okay. That's my world. All right. So, so over uh, the requirements. Uh, side of the house then. So thank you. So we've got uh, several levers that we use to try and manage this number. So 
Uh, Congress has very specific interests in this uh, from both the number of aircraft that we place on our carrier decks uh, and then the number of air wings that we have. So uh, when we testified this year, we testified that uh, in the year of 25, in last year we testified that was the year that we got to zero. In this year we're not at zero in 25 anymore. We are uh, at about the 31 range right there. But we do that analysis every single month because it's literally down to the tail number of each individual aircraft and how many hours are on that aircraft and then it's projected utilization rates depending on what we're going to do with that aircraft. That determines when it's going to run out of flight hours and therefore either contribute to the strike fighter shortfall or it will go into uh, what we call service life modification where it will go in and it will get rehabbed and it will get additional flight hours added to it. And then uh, as their boss mentioned earlier, uh, capability upgrades starting very soon. In the fall, the aircraft that we induct into that upgrade are going to come out of it as Block 3 Super Hornets uh, with a 10,000 hour life, uh, lifetime, full lifetime. So they'll go in about 6,000 hours and they'll come out with about 10,000 hours uh, total, so another 4,000 hours, which gets us between 12 and 13 years of utilization of that airframe. So that's the major rheostat that we use uh, to do uh, this adjustment. So I've got that rheostat and then I've got new production aircraft are the two major things that I get to control in order to manage that shortfall. And so uh, you could know from the 23 budget that we lost some uh, F-35 tails in that regard, and that was the primary driver of what changed when people say what changed from 22 to 23 in your testimony, and that's exactly what changed, is that if you cut those aircraft out across the fiscal year's defense plan, that is a direct reduction in that year of concern in the number of strike fighters available. So uh, then we start looking at how else we can apply levers in order to correct that shortfall. So uh, the biggest lever that we have available to us right now is that uh, um, you know, life modification to turn into Block 3 Super Hornets. And Joe Hornbuckle has started a, a third uh, SLM lineup three weeks ago. The first Super Hornet flew out to North Island, and I was on that airplane two days ago. Uh, and it's going through a modification, a step modification to 7,500 uh, hours. The outer wing panels are already off. The capacity of Fleet uh, Readiness Center uh, Southwest, the capacity is there. The artisans are there. It's, uh, it's an MRO facility uh, uh, already, and so we'll start populating the lines if we pull legacy platforms, the old Charlie platforms that were went to depot-level repairable repairs there in North Island. Now Superhorn is just stepping into those uh, empty bays right now. St. Louis, San Antonio, and a third line is now stood up in, uh, in North Island. So that's going to help, uh, uh, help with uh, strike fighter inventory management. Good question. So let me take another online question. This is from Peter Ong. Can you discuss the future of progress of UCAVs such as the MQ-25 and the X-58 Valkyrie? What is taking so long and how many UCAVs do the U.S. Navy intend to field? Would these UCAVs require new light carriers to be built to transport them? So this is maybe a future air wing kind of a thing. Uh, and this, I think, also has an Admiral Downey uh, uh, component to it in terms of emails and, and the advanced arresting gear's ability to launch and land lighter platforms was part of the design intent of that. So, so I'll, I'll start out with where we are on the requirement side of that, uh, that story. So anytime I talk about unmanned vehicles on an aircraft carrier, I talk about them in three distinct sets. Uh, the first set is something that can go into a hostile environment, high threat environment, and it can stay there. It can persist in a high threat environment. Uh, the second set is something that can go to that high threat environment, perform a given mission briefly, i.e. a strike mission, and then leave and have a very high chance of coming home. And then the last set is uh, something that is at an attritable price point, a much smaller vehicle, uh, that might perform any number of different missions. Anything from going out there with our fighter aircraft and carrying more um, air-to-air missiles for those types of missions, uh, or we might someday integrate that type of thing into our electronic warfare, a distributed architecture that would conduct that mission. And then we might also use those same types of uh, drones for uh, distributed command and control network. So as we go to the air wing of the future, we will be operating at ranges off of the aircraft carrier that vastly exceed what we're doing today. 
And so in order to do that, uh, unmanned portfolio really needs to be part of that system because it's the easiest way for us to keep a normally sized aircraft but then have all of that extra space for fuel that gets us the range that we require to be able to get out there and play with some of the aircraft that are under uh, development right now at uh, vastly higher ranges. So uh, under development right now, we have the MQ-25, uh, which is uh, first envisioned as a tanker. Uh, and so that's its primary role uh, in its initial instantiation. And so we expect that to be out making its first deployment in the 26th time frame. And so uh, they are real, and, uh, and there are several other things under uh, development right now uh, that uh, I'm, I'm very excited about. So, again, unclass, maybe you can't speak to some of this, but I remember the first time I was at NAVAIR and I saw a flight deck multiple that had, I think it was an X-47 on the flight deck, and I just thought of, you know, going behind the JBD and hear, hear an unmanned airplane taxis by you. That's the brave new world, right? So how do we intend to operate MQ-25s? Is, do they, are they going to be in the case one pattern with us? Are they doing separate, or is this TBD in terms of what the mobility TAC note will look like? So we have not nailed down an exact concept of operations for exactly what we'll do with that airframe. However, when you look, uh, and haven't been an aircraft carrier guy for some time now, uh, the number of aircraft that we refer to as tanking in anger, i.e. something happened and I really had to tank that person, is minuscule. Like it might happen a couple times on a deployment. Okay, so it is a uh, predominantly a mission tanker, which is going to happen away from the aircraft carrier, and then it's also a recovery tanker. But it's a recovery tanker for six, seven, eight, ten cycles in a row as opposed to being integrated into the case one pattern on each and every event like we do with our current Super Hornet tanker fleet. Yeah. So it's going to be out there for a good bit longer. So what's it's tanking in anger? I, you know, I want to get to that. That was the, uh, where you needed to do it. Vincent's uh, post cruise report, they went, they had two times where they had to tank. Remember, the entire deployment. A, yeah, the other point, remember precision landing mode? and yeah. delta flight path where okay. we're moving as we progress down to Sinatra. So boarding with, rates are great. Uh, the boarding rates are phenomenal. You know, the greenie board doesn't mean anything, you know, virtually doesn't mean anything anymore because the, the grades are up. So uh, I've never heard the tanking and anger statement before, but it's exactly it. And it brought up the post-cruise report where, you know, they had two events uh, where they had, uh, you know, they, they were an extremist and had to tank. So this is primarily, Bucket said it, you know, it's primarily a mission. It's gonna extend the ranges force for the carrier. Uh, and then extremis, how we use it. We've done, we've done the thought piece now on getting it off the carrier, getting it back. Obviously, George Herbert Walker Bush did the, did the taxi test when we craned one aboard, did the taxi test on it. For that, now we're talking to think about where does it go in the stack? Where does it go? Is it going starboard delta? You know, where is it recovered at the time? You know, where are we going to park uh, the numbers that we want to put on the carrier? Where are we going to put uh, and where we're going to park them? So uh, we're not... You know, this is, we're not just jumping into this um, uninformed today. We've been, we're, we've, we're working towards a model. IOC's coming up in 25, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that would be twice a night you tank an anger aboard JFK in 1987, right? Yeah. Um, so what, what's, the, what's the give of an MQ-25? The, the public number that we use is uh, she can pass 15,000 pounds of gas at 500 miles away from mom. So as a mobility tanker, that's, that's a, a lot of gas. That's, that's a lot of gas. gas. As a All and right, that's Sam, a long distance away from mom, too. Yeah, Roger. Sam Legron, Editor-in-Chief of USNI News. Hey, gentlemen, how are you today? Hey. Uh, just uh, one quick clarifying question. The um, UAVs you said were under development. Are, are, are those part of the NGAD program or something else? Uh, so let me repeat the question for the home viewers. What Sam asks is UAVs part of NGAD or no? I would say no. Okay, so we, when we talk about NGAD in the Navy, uh, yeah. Really? Is this like a GIF, GIF thing? Yeah, the Air yeah, Force really? says NGAD, we say NGAD. So, uh, you know, tomato, tomato, all that stuff. But um, uh, when we talk about the, uh, and the reason I say no isn't that they wouldn't be used with NGAD, it's that they are not exclusively for that platform. Okay, there's equal applicability in the manned on man teaming concept for any small UAS to be used with any aircraft on our flight deck. It's not limited to that one uh, capability. And then, and then the larger question is, how is pilot production and retention going? 
right now. So the question is, how is pilot production and retention going right now? Yeah, we've come out of the years, uh, the physiological events, and then 405 engines' uh, inability to, to get the production or to, to put 405 engines in T45s. Uh, last month, uh, Admiral Wessendorf hit rate, uh, so the production level for uh, students, uh, student naval aviators is... Uh, the rate is up to speed. We're going to miss uh, TAC Air Public, uh, TAC Air uh, production by six to eight this year. Uh, rotary we're going to miss because of mission capability rates of uh, TH-57 as TH-73. Uh, the Leonardo platform uh, fields its way in. Uh, so I'm not worried now TAC Air as well as the follow on TH-73. I'm not worried about production uh, uh, coming up. Retention's gonna be, uh, is something we're watching through uh, three specific uh, admin boards, through our department head board, our command screen board, as well as our major command screen board. And the first litmus test for us is in the department head uh, take rate. Uh, last year's take rate was within a five-year norm uh, of the take rates for an 03 taking it taking the department head bonus uh, to, to move his way into the 04 uh, this year uh, the rates are a little bit lower truthfully the rates are a little bit lower and we're seeing some of the platforms uh, 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 not get the numbers uh, that we'd like to have for selectivity it isn't that I don't have the numbers to man the seats. I'd like to be able to go to the boards and truly pick the best and most fully qualified. And we look for selectivity for that. You know, looking for you know 70 to 75 percent selectivity that uh, that I can uh, you know potentially not wash out, but at least I can truly you know have about a 20 to 25 percent ability to have folks you know get to go do something else for the Navy while the best uh, stay in. Um, you know, some of the platforms. Um, our bonus take rate are the, uh, you know, we're looking at P8s. The, those guys have a 737 type uh, qualification. That's pretty lucrative when you got 25,000 over the next uh, uh, five years are going to be hired by the airline industry. Um, uh, we're in competition uh, right now. I think the, the jury's out with a slight degradation uh, in retention. Uh, that we're looking to to arrest that we've got an NDAA proposal in to raise the uh, to raise the pilot bonus. Uh, I've got a JO uh, uh, symposium, uh, a list of key advisors, junior officers uh, that have uh, listed some of the top five degraders uh, uh, for them being in the Navy, and we're working on uh, we're working on some of those right now, which is, could be an alternate career path. Let them go do something. Uh, let them go uh, do something different other than. Uh, uh, and get off the golden career path uh, for coming in. I know it's it's kind of a vague answer right now. It's actually been pretty good. COVID uh, was uh, was uh, if there's one thing good that came out of it, COVID was pretty good. Our retention rates was up. Our department head take rate uh, numbers were up. So my first litmus test was satisfied. Now that we're coming out of COVID-19 and the airline industry is picking back up, now we're going back to the uh, uh, the same disclaimer. I'm not I'm not I'm not completely worried about it. This is my fourth sine wave of 37 years in. Hiring and furlough, hiring and furlough. This is the fourth time that I've seen a hiring climb, uh, and it's just a, it's always a matter of time before the other F word, the furlough word, comes in, uh, comes in afterwards right now. And the JOs are smart. They understand that, uh, and they understand the value of what they're doing for their country and, uh, by staying in. So, Admiral Loisel, were you a T2A4 guy or a T45 guy as a flight student? Uh, T2A4. So do you remember what boat you went to? Uh, I was Lexington. Lexington. Okay, so we had a dedicated CVT back in those days. Yeah. I'm only marginally younger than the air yeah. boss. <laughs> <laughs> Who's marginally younger than me? Um, so we're, T-45 has a shelf life, right? We're, we're trying to assess right now when, when that turns into a pumpkin. And I know one of the years in play is as late as 2035 because it's a metal jet. You can do Sidlam's easier, let's say, than you can with a, a composite airplane. So the next generation airplane uh, may or may not have to go to the boat, which is to say we may be winging tactical aviators without having them ever see the boat till they get to the rag. Airbus, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so we went back and looked at the data because as soon as this was being populated, uh, uh, obviously the retired crowd uh, saw heresy and the pitchforks and it burning. It surprises me. It surprises you, doesn't it? Uh, 
Uh, so we went back uh, over the last 10 years of the, of the data and we've, we saw an average of 16 to 19 percent uh, disqual rate and uh, the statement you and I have talked about where the boat has separated, you know, the carrier guys from uh, CQ was the CQ was the orange and white in Sinatra. That was the, the litmus test you had to pass to get to the uh, to get to the RFRS, FRS. Now that we've moved uh, PLM and and uh, Delta flight path into the start of the syllabus. It's always been at the start of the syllabus in the FRS for JSF, but now we made, you know, I was at an old guy decision. Okay, you better learn how to land the plane manually in the FRS first. There's no need that the X-47 landed by itself. MQ-25 is gonna land by itself. The same math principles and computing capability is built into precision landing mode. So we gave it to the students uh, at VFA 101 uh, and VF, VF, oh, it's old school, isn't it? VFA 101, VFA 106 and 122. And we saw that it is no longer, carrier qualification is no longer the, you know, the, the disclaimer uh, for moving from uh, gray FRS airplanes uh, into the fleet. We're down to the 4% uh, disqual rate. And again, two tanking and anger evolutions on Vincent's deployment. Well, so I was at a holiday party this year, and I was talking to some current Super Hornet JOs, and I was trying to engage them on ball flying techniques. And they looked at me like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> engage PLM, point flight path marker, land. So all of the sugar calls we used to give pilots, and you know, I don't know what you, how much you needed bucket in the Tomcat, but uh, I flew with some guys that were basically voice activated autopilots, right? So Tomcat was hard to land, Super Hornet not so much, F-35 even less so. So the idea that you don't see the boat until the rag is viable. You're not hazarding safety of flight, nope. and you're comfortable with that, that might be the outcome. It might be. We started with 30, uh, you know, we've got a test case with 30 pilots that we transitioned directly from uh, and in, I think five more still remain to transition from Sinatra right to the FRS. We'll, uh, this late summer, uh, early fall, the first uh, uh, non-Sinatra CQers will go, uh, will go CQ uh, in the FRS, and they're going to be our, they're our canaries in the coal mine on where we go. It's reversible. Got time left on T-45. This is the perfect time to, to do this because uh, we, can make, we can make informed, safe, tactical decisions on where we're going with carrier qualifications, FCLPs. I mean, the, the trickle down efficiency, safety, money savings, uh, and still make tactically uh, relevant aviators is uh, uh, it's just this is the right time to do it. So but when you do finally make a decision, among the options is an airplane that can't go to the boat. So no launch bar. Not a carrier qualified or a carrier can't go completely tailor. there because E2D. I don't have a uh, you know the, the E2D pilots still go to the boat as well as we still with our French partners. They still depend on us to uh, to train their TAC Air pilots. So I'm not I'm not backing out of the agreement with, that we have with the French, nor am I backing out of the uh, uh, you know being able to train E2 E2D pilots because they still go to the boat in Sinatra. They're not waived. Okay, they still go. Okay. Well, I see we're out of time. This has gone all too fast. Let me thank Huntington Ingalls Industries for supporting this panel. Again, this is our first MSD here in our home field of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. So thank the audience who's here in person. Thanks the audience on YouTube. And thanks very much to our three panelists who've come from, in some cases, San Diego. Kenny, it's good to see you, my good friend. And Admiral Downey and Loisel, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>